Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how important is creativity for wellness? And I'm in conversation with Zohab Z. Khan. Hi, uh, I'm Zohab Z. Khan. I am a performance poet, motivational speaker and life coach, as well as a workshop facilitator. I'm really excited to be here with you, Pugi. Thank you ever so much for joining me today. I'm excited to talk to you too. You've done many different things. So the question for the episode today is how important is creativity for wellness? So that's our jumping off point. Do you want to give us a bit of an overview on why that's the question and some first thoughts to, to get us going? I think it's uh, I think it's everything. I think creativity is wellness. Um, I love the topic of today's chat. Uh, I think creativity is one of those things that uh, is overlooked particularly in times like this, it's, we're all assumed to be in lockdown and we're giving all these important aspects and important, uh, putting all these influence on the important aspects on the key workers and the creative arts has been considered, okay, we can leave that to the side. However, I've found that uh, creativity, particularly in this time is absolutely integral to making sure that I stay in line, stay balanced. And um, my, my services have been well and truly needed in this particular time. So that's been something great that's come out of all of this. So tell us a little bit about what you do and how you use creativity then to support other people with their wellness. What does that kind of look like in practice? Workshops primarily. So I do a lot of workshops within high schools and primary schools, getting children to think outside of the box, um, using writing, using meditation techniques, primarily poetry. Poetry is, is, my, is my main trade and using poetry to get kids to think in different ways. Um, Just writing exercises, free writing, utilizing poetic techniques in ways that they usually wouldn't do, yeah. So talk to me about poetry. How did you come to start, like, first of all, writing poetry yourself and then beginning to workshop it with other people? What's been your kind of, I'm a big poetry fan. So yeah, I'd love to know a little bit about your your kind of journey there. Yeah. like the cliche, you know, I, I started writing when I was a young child and I was lucky enough not to stop. There was something about creativity that really anchored me and grounded me. And I found a lot of solace in it. To this day, I play imagination games. Mm-hmm. And um, from that, from poetry came hip hop and I wanted to be a hip hop artist. And I do a little bit of hip hop here and there. And I discovered this little competition called the Australian Poetry Slam Championships. And uh, I was found it by complete accident perusing YouTube one night when I should have been doing my assignments for university. And I realized that the very next day in my humble town of Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, which is smack bang in the middle of New South Wales, um, the very next round of the Australian Poetry Slam Championships was gonna be on. So I entered it, this was back in 2009 and um, I wanted to win the national championships. It took me about five years of failing and getting this close and losing by 0.1 and forgetting my words a couple of times on stage. And in 2014 at the Sydney Opera House, I I won the national championships. And from there, an entire career happened to just, you know, just come out of that and becoming, there's something special about being able to say, hi, my name is Zohab Z Khan, the Australian Poetry Slam champion. It sounds uh, super cool. I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I said to my husband this morning when I, I like I'd looked you up on Twitter mm. and everything ahead of our chat and yeah. um and I showed him like who you are I'm like I'm definitely not cool enough to be talking to this guy but um you know was looking forward to it so what is a poetry slam so I love poetry and every now and then I come across these kinds of things too but w- what is it what's the difference between yeah poetry and a poetry slam? just tell us more yeah uh, poetry slam is just the competitive aspect of performance poetry performance poetry it's in the name, it's poetry that's performed usually on a stage, need not be always on a stage. And p- poetry slams are when you get usually two or three minutes, you've got some judges, you've got 10, 15, 30 other uh, competitors go through the various rounds and supposedly the best poet wins, not always the case, but uh, we have a saying amongst the poetry slam scene, the point is not the points, the point is poetry. So about getting getting poetry in a competitive aspect out there is is the main goal. You know, people love competition. Yeah. They do. And so 
is it um do you prepare the poems beforehand or do you is it improvised or how 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 does it work yeah yeah you before prepare the poems beforehand get it really etched to your brain um that's why sometimes i have literally stood up on stage and went blank uh, not so much nowadays. Nowadays, um, I'm a seasoned veteran of the performance world. And if it does go blank, I've had, you know, dramatic pauses for, for you know, <laughs> 30 seconds. It's all part of the performance. They, yeah, they're right. never the wiser. Um, but yeah, you do before, before, prepare it beforehand. Uh -huh. And do you get like, do you have to do it on a particular topic or anything? Or is it just kind of completely? Oh, wow. Yeah. So what yeah. makes for a good performance? poem or like a poem a poetry slam like what you obviously honed your art over those years in order to win it sounds like you didn't just turn up one day and win it you learned how to to get better and better like what was that about is it about the poetry about the performance about the what, what yeah what's what's a winning poem usually something that uh the cliche would be to do something social justice wise and you know speak mm -hmm. speak the truth in, in regards to that i'm not necessarily uh, a believer in that i think a good poetry slam winning poem is just a poem where you're when you're authentic okay. and i think life is just better when you're authentic when you're showing your true version of yourself and that's what poetry slam allows you know just to present one authentic version of yourself up on a stage uh, and that's the secret if there's any secret to winning if you're real and raw and authentic up on stage and it sounds nice whilst you're doing it oh, there's no reason why you won't win and is there ever a risk when you're being like real and raw in your poetry that like in terms of kind of safeguarding yourself i guess if you go kind of deep about your own feelings and, and things i just reflecting on a time so i wrote a book about using poetry to promote healing and uh, it has a lot of my own poems in it just as examples not because i think that they're good but just as sort of starting points for discussion but off the back of that many years ago i was asked to run a workshop with a bunch of psychiatrists about mm. using poetry with patients who had eating disorders and so we looked at some of my poems around eating disorders and honestly it, it I mean it was really powerful and they went off and used it but it was deeply uncomfortable um going there with them in that room when at the time I was evidently not really well um yeah I just remember like thinking I had to think really carefully in future about if I was going to share my own poetry face to face with people about what it was okay to share and what it wasn't at any given time I just wonder if that's something that you've experienced too or that other poets have to safeguard before i answer that question may i flip it back at you and ask you whether or not <laughs> you consider yourself a poet do i consider myself a poet yeah no I, I i've written a lot of poems so i wrote a poem every day for about three years um just because i i wrote one for a funeral and i'd never written a poem since i was a child and i mm. liked writing it and i basically wondered if i did this more could i get good at it um yeah. and so i think in rhyme and i love to write poetry but i i wouldn't consider myself a poet because uh i i, I don't know how to write good poetry i i just you know put words on paper um, but okay. I do encourage people to write bad poetry. I always say it doesn't matter what you're writing and what the level is, uh, you know, it, it, it's about uh, engaging with it. And, and the other thing I always found, um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, was that when I shared my poems in a public space, so I always had a, a blog, um, mm -hmm. then it was really interesting. I never wrote anything about what they were about or why I'd written them. I just shared the poem and I loved hearing other people's interpretations um, and people would interpret them different ways. And sometimes I find when I read back on my old poetry, I read it with different, uh, yeah, with a different lens than I wrote it, if that makes sense. Um, so. Absolutely. Well, just to, to bounce off the question that I uh, asked you, absolutely from everything that you said, Regardless of whether or not you consider yourself a poet, from my perspective, you are 100% a poet, especially considering you've written a poem every day for three years and you've performed it at funerals and that kind of stuff. And you've captured a moment in our life, uh, in our collective experience, you know, and that's what poetry is for me. It's, it's about capturing one aspect of yourself, going back to being authentic mm -hmm. and capturing something that's in our zeitgeist or catch, capturing uh, common human experience, be that death or birth or love or hate or war or whatever it is. Um, so A, I definitely think you're a poet. B, to answer your question, yeah, it is. It's extremely daunting sometimes to get up on a stage and share something and something that's raw. And you've told me your poems have been in books, in your book, um, and you felt very vulnerable about that. And that's 
such a common experience amongst um, creatives. And when we create and human beings, particularly in my workshops, um, there's this vulnerability. And I've found, I do workshops from five years old, kindergarten, all the way into university students and adults. But you know, my when I'm working within schools, I find five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten primary school kids. Oh yeah, you want me to write a poem? Let me write a poem. Ba 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 ba. Whatever it is. The older they get, um, but sir, I'm not a poet, you know. And we we hold ourselves back because of this idea that what are other going other people going to think? And it's not my, it's none of my business. It's absolutely none of my business what anybody else thinks about my poetry. Um, I do it because I do it. I do it because it is a wellness technique for myself. It's just a wellness technique that other people happen to enjoy, you know. <laughs> That's a really nice way of looking at it. And certainly when people talk to me about, you know, should they write or any kind of a creative endeavor, should I start a YouTube channel? Should I write? Should I whatever? Then usually my starting point is do it for yourself. Um, and if you're enjoying it, that's great. And if other people want to come along for the ride, perfect. But um, I think for me personally, those kind of creative endeavors, you need to do them really from a point of your own personal kind of, yeah, enjoyment and passion. And maybe not just creativity, actually. I've, I've said the same to people who've asked me about should they pursue a PhD? And it's like, hmm. if you really want to, if you really enjoy the process um, and you're passionate about it, yes. If it's because you want to call yourself doctor, no. -uh. <laughs> <laughs> what's, um, what's the difference between hip hop and poetry? So you've said you've kind of done both. What, 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 what's the line? What is the line? I think poetry is an overarching aspect. I think that it's, if there was a diagram over it, there would be overlapping aspects, okay. obviously. Um, whenever I'm, I'm in one of my workshops, I define poetry uh, as one or more words. You know, this, this conversation is, is poetry as far as I'm concerned. Some poetry is better than other poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, so far, this has been great poetry. I was going to say what you're saying about our conversation so far. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great poetry, Pookie. But uh, hip, with hip hop, hip hop is just an aspect of poetry. I find uh, lyrics, song lyrics, be they hip hop or ballads or whatever they are, it's poetry, right? Um, hip hop just happens to be a particular genre of music and, um, you know, ha has its attributes of using vernacular terms and, you know, comes from a particular zeitgeist. Yeah. And do you think that um, there are kind of rules to what makes like, better poetry or starting points like when you're running your poetry workshops can you talk to me a little bit about what do you tell to young people or, or people whoever you're teaching like so they mm. can create something what what are, what are the rules or the guidances <laughs> yeah so two ways to answer that question the, the initial um foundation that i give to anyone that's in my workshop is number one to take the pressure completely off when we take the pressure completely off and it's what we were talking about before of this oh what are other people going to think and we hold ourselves back uh, i don't care who you are whether you are you know the extreme eccentric you know hippie that lives down the road that's considered artistic or the canary wharf accountant you're you're both creatives you know there's there's this creative fire within both of both of those human beings we as human beings are creative it's the same reason why you know we have similar brain structures to so many other um, species on this planet and our close primate cousins and all of that, but we're the ones that are going to the moon. We're the ones that are digging holes in the ground and seeing what comes up. And the reason we do that is because we have this, what is it? What's this, this internal desire inside of us to, to create and find out what's behind that door and find out what's behind that rock. And I think that's what it comes down to when uh, we're creating. So take the pressure completely off because it's well and truly within our nature to, to want to find amazing things. And to answer the other part of your question, what makes good poetry? When you've taken the pressure off completely and you're being a more authentic version of yourself, only then do I um, encourage students to learn about poetic techniques and different structures and different rhyme schemes. And all of that can wait. You know, all of that can be. I'm a forever student for poetry. I'm forever learning a different style of poetry or a different structure and a different poetic techniques and, you know, literary devices. Yeah, of course, with anything, you you get better at, hello, um, you get better at any any aspect of 
of, of any craft and you can come down to the fundamentals, you're going to get good at it, you know, metaphors and similes and all that. And then all the way up to terms of remas and all that. So, yeah. Yeah, hope so that I think sometimes the, the different techniques and the structures and things can be fun. Like I think if you embrace them with the spirit of fun. So I always remember writing, what was the name? I think it was a golden shovel where you took a poem you'd previously written or read and you used each word as, I can't remember if it was the first word or the last word of the line of the next poem. It was something like that, like really contrived, but mm -hmm. like a great challenge. I loved it. Um, and, and that's the thing, when I was writing every day, I was always, and I would write poetry prompts so other people would join in too, which was fun. But um, yeah, finding different things to spin off, whether it was a question or a word or a structure or, you know, whatever, whatever is the starting point. So I think it can be a bit scary knowing, like if you just, you know, write a poem, wow, where do I start? <laughs> Yeah, it can, it can be, right? Um, I always encourage every single um, workshop I've ever run, I always start with an exercise called the brain dump. It's something I encourage everyone to do. Listeners that are listening right now or watching, I, I would encourage a brain dump. And my spiel of a brain dump is um, basically just write. Doesn't matter if you use a pen, pencil, text stub, lipstick i don't care um <laughs> you know and it's it's all about just getting things out of your head it's about getting everything from your brain dumping it on a piece of paper and not worrying about of the spelling or the grammar or the neatness or the messiness or what are other people going to think about this or is this a deep desire that i haven't ever put out into the world um just just letting it be and the only rule is to not let your pen stop moving and it's amazing that that simple simple exercise with a fancy name like a brain dump has an amazing results. The things that come out of brain dumps and I encourage people to share it if you want to share it or throw it in the bin and burn it if you don't want to. Um, and that makes all the difference of taking that pressure off. It's a great foundation. Because, so you use that rather than, a, so you don't start with a blank page essentially, is that the idea? Yeah, uh -huh. and from that you can pull out ideas if you want, um, but if anything, it allows your brain to start working in a different way. Uh -huh. um, Get, get your head into that diffuse frame of mind. I like that. I like that. That's a really nice, neat way of starting. And so you've taught a lot of workshops. So I read on, I guess it would have been your website. So you've done over a thousand poetry um, or creative arts workshops. Like, have you got bored at any point? I mean, did it become samey? <laughs> did I get bored at any point? That's a good question. No, I don't think so. Uh, did I get bored? I've, I've never had that question. That's a great question. I don't <laughs> think so. I don't. I tell you what will make a person bored. A person will become bored with routine and routine is one of the best things that we can have in our life. Mm -hmm. And I've never really had much of routine. I'm, I'm a life coach and routine is something that benefits a lot of people. And it's a great structure to have to your day. Mm -hmm. um, creativity is anti-routine. You can schedule creativity within your days and you can schedule it within your life. Um, but I also think that there should be time for play. And because I've always given myself a lot of play time and my workshops are very tongue in cheek and I jump around. I, you can't tell on this Zoom, I, I stand at two meters tall and I use all, every single one of those 200 centimeters. To, wow, that's to tall. Win. Like how tall is that in old money? That's like what, six oh. foot? Six, oh, six, foot six. Six foot six. Wow. Six foot six in old money. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a shame we're not meeting face to face because I'm very nearly five foot three, and it would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, so you use every 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 one of those uh, centimeters to jump. Yeah, I, I I just yeah. Uh, uh, if anything, to answer your question, no, I've never been bored because <laughs> I'm well and truly in the moment with my workshops. You know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Sorry, my cat is uh, joining in with the uh, podcast here. She likes to have attention all the time. So, okay, so I saw on your website then maybe this this builds on your um, workshops not being dull and you using every inch of your many inched body. Mm. Um, but uh, I saw a picture on your website of like people with their hands in the air um, at, at some kind of workshop or something, I guess. What would have been going on there? What what, do you, what are you making people do, Zohab? <laughs> what was that one? Uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's a, just a standard power pose um standard power pose but i do it in a particular way of getting you out of your seat moving around get your hands up all that and it's actually the origin story of that is um owning your own name so i'm big on owning your own name 
Um, my name's Zohab, and I, I didn't necessarily like the name Zohab for a very long time, particularly growing up in a very, very small country town in the middle of Australia. Um, I grew up in a town called Yenda, uh, and there was 900 people in that town. <gasps> and 80, yeah, <laughs> 900 people in that town, 85 students in the primary school, and, and only one Zohab. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I just, hear you on the the unusual name thing. Just just saying, it's great as an adult, though. No. Yes, as an adult, when you grow into it, yeah, absolutely, it is. As a child, it's it's a little bit different. And um, I remember coming home from school one day, absolutely in tears, and my I, my mother asked me, "Why are you crying?" and told her, well, the kids have been calling me loser at school, you know, saying I've got a funny name, all of these things. And it's like, what do you mean funny name? You've got a great name. You've got the same name as your great grandfather when he was a warrior. And you know, that's, that's who you were named after, not a loser. And I was like, oh gosh, that's, that's amazing. Why didn't you tell me this mom? Uh, tell me this before. Why are you telling me this now at the ripe old age of seven? And, <laughs> and I, I found that many, like, I love that story. And to that day, it, to this day, it holds very, very special to me. Um, I found out many, many years later that I was not named after my grandfather. Complete lie in the moment, but it got my confidence up. Uh, parents are funny things, you know? Tell me he was a warrior though. Oh, absolutely, he was a warrior. I come from a long line of warriors, but I was not named after him. He had a completely different name. But what she did do was made me go out into my backyard, pull my hands up and um, just, keep repeating my name again and again, like a warrior. And to a seven year old, that's very, very special. And it's very, very powerful. And that's something that I was lucky enough to be exposed to at a young age. And my mom played with my brain a lot, you know, for good or bad, I think all parents do. Yeah. And I, I, got out, I got out pretty unscathed. And these are the same techniques um, that, I, that I teach in my, in my workshops. That's really cool. So what exactly is a power pose? Asking for the audience. Oh, of. absolutely. Power pose. Uh, we can we can half do one. We're both sitting, which is fine. Would you like to do a power pose right now? I will. I've got a cat on my lap, but I don't think that should stop me. Go on, that I'm ready. Never stop you. Uh, if anything, it just adds to your power, right? Uh, power pose. If we were standing, those of you listening or watching could stand as well. Um, you stand up, feet shoulders width apart. Really stamp them in the ground. Give them a little stamp. Feel like they're in the ground, concrete is keeping you down in a good way. Uh, shoulders back, chin up, and uh, really concentrating on the top of your spine, which is this little lump at the back of your head. Mm -hmm. And just getting that nice and straight, hands on your hips. And you just stand there, breathing in through your nose, out of your mouth, Oof, really feeling that power through you. Once you feel well and truly in that moment, this is something a lot of business people use. I like to take it to the next level and then just put your hands up. And there was this- Why, why? Like, oh, why? <laughs> is it Let's that you've go. got the power though? Because I feel a bit silly now because we're doing a podcast and everyone's listening. Not I'm sitting all, here with my all. hands in the air. Not at all. This is, <laughs> and that it comes down to feeling it. It'll kick in, it'll kick in. Keep that chin up for me. <laughs> Keep that chin up for me, Pookie. And uh, we can, Nelly, generally that's the thing. We can put our arms down. <laughs> That's a power pose. You do it for long enough. I recommend about a minute. And when I do this um, with my audiences, that's when the endorphins start kicking in. That's when the giggles start kicking in. And then we yell our name as loud as we can. And there was this great, great um, experiment done where they had two groups of people and one group of, then they took them to the top of a bungee jump. Mm -hmm. And one group of people, they got to go up there just normal and put them in the fetal position. They put them in the fetal position right at the top and then said, go on, get up and do the bungee jump. I think it was something like one person did it and the remaining six of the seven were like, no thanks. Um, oh, wow. good, or, it took a, or it took them an incredibly long time to do. And those of them who did the power pose um, jumped. They all wow. jumped under 30 seconds or something ridiculous like that. And that just shows those endorphins that are pumping through your body, the chemistry that's happening to you at that particular time is absolutely, you know, it dictates your future. Wow. And that's why I like to keep myself in, in, in state whenever you can, you know, little breathing exercises. Um, yeah, we're, and creativity is such a huge aspect of that. Uh, the brain dump's a great place to start. 
but also just taking the pressure off off your brain and that's what I try to teach in my workshops so when would you use a power pose you're using them in your workshops to get everyone kind of in the zone feeling they can do this presumably but like in you, you do life coaching as well do you teach these kind of techniques to people I uh, yeah definitely I think there's I'm so fortunate that I became a life coach um, because there are parallels between creativity and, and having performance arts background and life coaching uh -huh. um, because all life coaching is, is your life coach encouraging you to be more creative with your life. When you understand more aspects of yourself and you allow yourself to take the pressure off yourself, you, you learn more about you, about you, the human being and you, the human being is absolutely worthy of love. Um, you start loving yourself a lot more and that's the thing right when you it's that cliche of do what you find out what you love and you'll never work a day in your life which I think is a little bit shaky when you find out what you love you work a lot harder at it you know because yeah. you know what's at stake uh, you would know that right we're having this lovely <laughs> conversation now and when you when you learn to love yourself a lot more and you have that space to be creative with yourself and the way that you think you spend a lot more time investing in yourself rather than, you know, trying to make yourself feel good in, in all these other aspects. Um, I do teach as things like power poses uh, and like those little techniques, but my job as a life coach in that aspect of my life isn't to teach you techniques. It's to allow you to, the space to create your own techniques that work for you. You know, um, I wake up every single morning, do my power pose, jump out of bed. I give myself a nice 10 second countdown and they're the longest 10 seconds of my day. When mm -hmm. I wake up, think about it, I'll meditate. I love to recap my dreams. I'm an active dreamer. And then I'll give myself a countdown to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, jump up, power pose and kick into my day. And that's not to say that I'm one of those annoying, super, motiv super motivated um people it's that's just what resonates with me and someone else has got their own version of that yeah so how did you become a life coach and do you enjoy it love it um absolutely love it uh always thought about becoming a life coach um i've been a motivational speaker um for about six seven years now and that's what it took me around the world um and ever since lockdown i moved to london about i think 15 months ago because I was a little bit tired of the international travel um, from Australia. I was, you know, it's a, it takes a while for a plane just to get outside of Australia, you know, it gets out. Yeah. And so when you leave, you leave for quite some time. And I found that the last five years of my life had been spent completely on the road. And um, I wanted to be on this part of the world, in this part of the world, because there was something, there's just a lot more happening and there's a lot more concentration of human beings all in one place. And I love human beings. <laughs> so when lockdown hit, all my plans went out, out the window, no more traveling to be a motivational speaker. <laughs> and I finally, for the first time in half a decade, had a chance to sit and be in one place, um, be that on purpose, uh, be that forceful or whatever you know like with a lot of people and I realized I had always wanted to get my qualification as a life coach and build upon those skills so it's it's quite a recent thing um, to be qualified uh, it was it was hap it happened during lockdown and I absolutely love it it's something that brings me a lot of joy and I've got a session right after this as well oh wow so is it so it's a relatively recent thing but something you'd been kind of wanting to do for a long time I think those are often the best things aren't they that uh, great things come to those who wait I guess yeah. yeah and it's interesting you're saying about the yeah lockdown having that big impact I had a thought the other day where I was feeling a little bit edgy about going beyond the end of the end of the road because we never go anywhere now and um yeah my daughter was like well that's your international speaking career put paid to then isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah. <laughs> but we can be you know as we we chatted at the beginning I didn't know where you were in the world and you could have mm. been anywhere and actually now it doesn't matter does it the world has got so small during uh, during this time so okay so your life coaching your motivational speaking your workshopping you're doing a lot of different things what's your like do you have a kind of grand plan or do you just take each day as it comes what's what's yeah what, what, what's the plan my super super grand plan is a secret um, oh, I keep that Zohan, come very, on. very close to my, my, I, I keep it very, very close. Um, okay. I, 
there, there is a lot of value in letting people know what your grand grand plan is because you're more likely to achieve it. Um, there's also a lot of value to what I call an inner circle. And I've got an inner circle of my most trusted confidants who hear about these plans. Mm -hmm. But to not take away from this lovely chat that we're saying that I'm keeping <laughs> secrets from you, Pookie, uh, the, the longer term goal uh, in a soft way is, is to develop an entire wellness um, you know, program around myself and, and, and my inner circle, my favorite, my favorite, favorite people so that we can make the world better, you know, and I, not, we don't need to make this huge impact, but if there's any purpose in life, it is to create something bigger and better than yourself. Yeah. And, you know, many heads and many minds do that together a lot better. And that's, that's the grand, grand goal. Um, where that's going to be done and how that's going to be done. That's, that's a secret, Pookie. Uh, well, I can't, help, well, I can't help you with your secrets though, Happy. Tell me what it is. I can help you change the world. But um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's secret, I can't help. Um, but you talk on your website about wanting to kind of shift cultures in, in schools and, and I guess other organizations. So um, that's your kind of general, you, you basically want to make the world a better place. Yeah, like, like us all, right? Um, I'm not too preoccupied with things like legacy and what are, how are people going to remember me when I'm gone? I'm, I'm here for such a short, short period of time. And I just want to be as creative as I can and allow other people to do that as well and allow them to, to, to be happier amongst it. You know, I think happiness mm -hmm. is just a byproduct of creativity. Um, that's why I think creativity is such an important aspect of wellness um, because it just allows you to be and like, I think if there's been a thread through our conversation, Pookie, it's, it's that authenticity and, yeah. you know, allowing to yourself to be yourself. Yeah. And when you do that, um, you know, life just gets easier. We, we put on so many masks and we put on so many things that I need to be this and this and this. I'm a mother or I'm a father or I'm a this, I'm a son. And yeah, we play different roles and there's different attributes that we bring to the table on those days. But when you when you spend time with yourself and you allow yourself to be creative on the page or wherever it happens to be you you come with the better self you know you come with with true you and that's a game changer yeah it's hard though isn't it to be yourself um you'd think it'd be the easiest thing in the world but i think it's something a lot of people find incredibly hard and um one of the things i i was wondering about and wanting to talk to you about really was that question around things like role models. So I've spoken to quite a lot of people um, during the course of the podcast who've talked about the things that have inspired them to pursue the career that they have has sometimes been along the lines of there wasn't someone like me when I was a child. And uh, I spoke to a psychiatrist earlier this week and she's a Muslim female and there were no such people like that for her to aspire to, but hopefully the next generation um, of Muslim females might think that psychiatry is a potential profession for them. And, um, you know, the, I, I, I wonder if that, you know, whether you had kind of role models or whether you see yourself as a role model. <sighs> whether I see, I had a chat with one of my best friends in the world um, earlier this morning and he's developing a great project in our hometown and he told me there's you know there's a there's a role model wall in this particular project that he's doing and it's you know famous people from you know the past da, 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 motivational people and he said my picture's going up and i was like oh gosh that was a i don't know a watershed moment or a, like i just had to had to really absorb that moment so some people can assume sorry some people think that i am a role model so that's very humbling um, but yeah, very similar, very similar. There was no one like me and growing up, and I'm not sure if there are any one like me. Um, I'm a fourth generation Australian Pakistani living in London. And that, as far as I know, there's not another one of those that exists. Wow. I know all of the fourth generation Pakistani Australians. There's like 30 of them, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> none of them are spoken word poets and none of them are living in London. And we've all got this uniqueness to us. Um, it's how you define that, that's up to you. Uh, the reason I got into spoken word poetry and performance and being a life coach has been an accident. It's mm -hmm. been a big, 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 big accident. Um, I just really enjoyed being myself on stage. It was a place where I could really shine. Um, and like I mentioned, being two meters tall, um, I've always wanted to be big. You know, 
but um, not in a not in an ego way or anything, but be big in the sense that I feel big and I, I want to show that off. Why not? And when you're young, you know, there's that has different connotations. But growing up in, you know, regional Australia, it had a lot more attached to it. And so I had to make myself very small yeah. because I was I was a different one. Um, so I think poetry and creativity and wellness allowed me to be an authentic version of myself. And the authentic version of myself is I'm absolutely huge. Um, and so, so we all are, you know, in our own ways. And that's what I try to facilitate. And I guess one of the nice things about uh, you, you've been everywhere, but you've chosen London for now, at least. Um, it is a place, I think, where you can be yourself there's a space for everyone here isn't there it's very multicultural um yeah. and in your I'm, I'm interested to talk to you about your so your visa you mentioned um in the uh discussion beforehand uh when when we were organizing this that you just received your uh your brp in the mail tell me tell, tell us about this what, what, what what's this about that's uh, the brp is the british residency permit um little card with my face on it that says I'm allowed to live here for the next five years. Uh, I'm on the tier one visa, which is the global talent exceptional promise visa. And uh, it's a tough one to get. Um, I looked up the stats of 2019, 2020. And I think for literature, they gave 11 visas out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was one of the most, uh, yeah. I, all God knows how many pages of my application um, I had to put in. Wow. And it was it was one of the most stressful things that I've done in a while. Do you just basically pick really like massive goals and be like, I'm going to do that. I love you like Perch your Grand Slam, going to win that. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible visa, mine. <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, why not? I don't look, I don't believe in uh, what is it? What is it? The I don't believe in the law of attraction and all of that stuff. And like, you know, set your goals and you'll get it. I do believe in, you know that uh, you set goals and your brain will start figuring out ways to get there. I don't think the universe is going to do it for you. So I do believe in setting your goals incredibly high and, you know, your reticular activating system will figure out how to get you there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I read a book recently called Shoot for the Moon. I think it was Shoot for the Moon. Yeah. Uh, but it was basically about the, um, it was kind of a business book, but it was about the American space program and how they achieved that goal um, and how you could take some of what went well with that program and use it uh, within your business to achieve incredible things. Um, and it seemed that essentially the, you know, one of the key things was having a goal that was almost impossible but not quite um yeah. and that when you shoot really high that yeah you, you you're more likely to get there and certainly that that was something that i've kind of taken on board in terms of our business right now is well i'm gonna i'm gonna aim unachievably high and uh, just see where we land <laughs> yeah and so you should um look i know it's i know i'm gonna sound like a typical motivational speaker or whatever but it's such a miracle us being here Mm. It, the odds of us being here is what was it i did a video on my youtube the other day i, I don't recall the number what is it it's the probability of us being here is two in wait one in 10 to the power of 2.65 million so with 10 with 2.65 million zeros it's basically zero you know and you know to keep it pg because i know some kids listen to this but when when we were conceived there was all these other little fellas that didn't quite get there, that didn't, <laughs> they were all shooting for the moon they didn't quite shoot yeah. you know they didn't quite get there our version whatever it was um did and we got here and i think we won the lottery and i think we should keep shooting for the moon and some of us make it some of us don't there's mm -hmm. all these other people that have achieved aimed for the same goals that I have and yeah. aren't having a podcast with Pookie right now. And that's <laughs> not to take anything away from them. And that's not to say that I'm any more or less special than that. It's just that you need to be in it to win it. Just to use another yeah. Question. And I think maybe I think there's something important about being open to opportunities as well, isn't there? Sometimes people have asked me in the past about how, you know, they could do what I do and what's the route to that kind of career. I, I can't tell them because I'm a bit like you actually, where it all feels like it's happened almost accidentally, but actually nothing happens 
really I don't think in my life um, and, and many people's lives completely by chance it's about putting yourself out there opening up conversations and being prepared to say yes I think even when yes is maybe a bit scary sometimes um, you said in um, uh, in our in the notes you sent me before our conversation to, to ask you about talking to strangers waterfalls and talking to strangers are in my oh. notes <laughs> waterfall and talking to strangers it feels like so long ago that I filled that out yeah 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 um talking to strangers is one of my favorite things to do okay. and London's been a little bit different in the sense that strangers don't talk to each other no. um no no not at all and that was one thing that took me a while to to get my head around and um, I miss it. I miss it a lot. But it, as I've learned the culture and the lay of the land, um, strangers do talk. Uh, not so much in lockdown and not so much in social distancing times. But I'm scratching the, scratching the surface. Get it's a one dog. Of the, that's the answer to talking a, to strangers, even in London. That's true. That's true. I have seen, a, have you seen how many dog babies there are? Oh, there are so many dog babies. Yeah. So, everyone got a little bit bored and they either made dog babies or baby babies um during you know life. there's an actual yeah all the baby babies that are being made are definitely first-time parents i swear anyone who already had children would yeah. not be making more babies right now <laughs> I, I i love my kids <laughs> but it's been tough times um, and the dog thing is really interesting i was reading the other day how there's this like there's a genuine issue because councils are really struggling to empty the poo bins because there's loads more dogs and um they're you know they're down on staff and down on budget and so yeah poo bins are overflowing so it's <laughs> it's a problem but yeah get a dog that's the way to talk to strangers in london even maybe in london. maybe well it's one of the things that i love about london it's one of the reasons i call it home mm. um is because what you mentioned earlier about how multicultural it is pookie and how everyone can be be themselves and yeah. i remember the first time i came here was in 2016 I was performing at Glastonbury and I landed in London, this amazing city. I'm going to one of my, you know, bucket list um, festivals that I've always wanted to perform at. So life is good. And it took me, oh, what was it? it took me probably about half a day to realize, wait a second, no one's looking at me. All two meters of me. I had a twirly mustache at the time and no one's looking at me. What on earth is going on? And it was one of the most refreshing things that I've ever felt in my entire life because wherever I go, I'm, I still, I, A, I stick out like a sore thumb or I'm the one that has the different skin tone or whatever it happens to be, whatever reason it is, good, bad, in the middle. Yeah. And London doesn't have that. And I was like, yeah, it allowed me to be quote unquote a normal person. And that was just, yeah, my favorite, favorite thing about this incredible city um that's yeah. cool yeah. and waterfalls tell me about waterfalls that i live for the waterfalls i live for that very first moment me the poet should have already figured out a word for this okay and i'm not sure when i'm going to but my favorite feeling in the entire world there's a few up there um is seeing a new waterfall for the very first time Oh, wow. When you see a waterfall for the very first time, there should be a word for it. And if someone's listening, go on, make make your own word. Um, beat me to it. <laughs> I think um, that would be a great word. You're reminding me of, um, I went to Slovenia a couple of years ago. So in non-lockdown times, I learned in the last few years that I need time out from life uh, periodically. Mm. So um, it used to happen by ending up in hospital, but now I proactively plan it. So uh, I've done things like go and learn to draw for a week in the valleys in Wales and uh, things like that. But this one year I went to Slovenia on a kind of um, activity holiday. So we did like paragliding and canyoning and climbing and all those kinds of things uh, with a bunch of people I never met before. And one day we um, took mountain bikes up a mountain and we were going up, 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 like five kilometers up a mountain uh, in order to see this beautiful waterfall at the top yeah. of the mountain. And when we got there, it had been a really dry, hot summer. It was like 37 degrees. So it was a very, very tricky, tricky journey. Uh, it got to the top and this waterfall was literally like a little dribble. Um, so we had to go <laughs> home and watch videos of what it would look like uh, at other times of the year. But it was like such an anticlimax, but it was hilarious. Um, yeah. Because we'd like been journeying to this destination and when we got there we just literally fell about laughing um because yeah, yeah. but it's like waterfalls okay i think somebody needs to create a word for the joy of seeing a new waterfall for the first time why do I you like the, them this, oh it's life right it's life falling 
um yeah it's it's life falling to the ground and like still being okay mm -hmm. um there's something about that feeling and there's something about that noise and there's something about just um you know the percentage of water that is in me having that resonating feeling between between myself and the water uh there's just something incredibly beautiful about it uh, i love sitting on the edge of them i love you know I'm, i've got problematic risk-taking behavior um, and you know, there's something about edges and there's something about water and there's something that really, really, um, makes me feel, feel alive. And, um, you know, extremely appreciative of, of this, you know, so I definitely recommend a canyoning trip in Slovenia. If you love waterfalls and you like okay. risk taking, it's great fun. Slovenia, Croatia, I hear there's a lot of like really cool waterfalls yeah in, you know, that part of europe yeah yeah amazing really and beautiful as well absolutely beautiful um i'm gonna bring it back to poetry just because yeah. i have a question that came in from my friend terry on twitter um mm -hmm. so he is an artist and a poet he writes poems um and he's sometimes drawn images to go with my poems which is lovely so he says does performance poetry work without an audience and can you use it to make yourself feel better yes and yes Yes, yes. Okay, and thanks yes. for your comprehensive answers on that, Sohab. I'm, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> no worries, Terry. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, poetry definitely, performance poetry definitely works without an audience. I know it, it sounds counterintuitive, um, but some of my best performances have been alone. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got a vivid imagination and I, I love imagining a crowd and you know, those poems that I perform to my imagination crowd become poems later on. Um, but there's still something extremely therapeutic ab about it. Um, yeah, there's incredibly, there's great therapeutic um, things about having a nice imagination and chilling to the ground. What was the other part of the question? Whether you can use it to make yourself feel better. Oh, I think I kind of answered it. I think you it, probably yeah. covered that, yeah. Yeah, you, it does. I, and I, I found that so one of the reasons why I got in that habit of writing a poem every day so it's partly I set myself this challenge would I get better if I did it a lot but also um so in my line of work I end up managing like a lot of disclosures and hearing quite difficult stuff mm -hmm. and um I don't get any kind of professional supervision or anything like that and I found that I was able every day to put whatever needed to be put into a poem and then it would be done um, and I could park it and move on. And actually, it's really important, I think, when you're dealing with difficult stuff, whether it's your own stuff or someone else's. It, for me, it was really important to be able to put that stuff to bed before I put myself to bed each day. Um, and, and poetry did allow me to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, it really helped. Yeah. Um, and then I had a final question. Um, so you um, you integrate um, Urdu and Pujab Punjabi. Oh, God, I messed that up. I? You use different languages in your work. Yeah. Um, um, and you said you kind of integrate them seamlessly. Why why do you do that? And why does it matter? Like, why is that a thing that you're you're talking about? That's not meant to be a controversial question. It's a genuine question. Um, um, because it's it's a part of me right it's it's most definitely a part of me um urdu lives in me urdu is an incredibly poetic language so too is punjabi and they're the languages that my ancestors spoke and i believe in you know ancestral energy and you know those those ideas and those um concepts that live within inside inside you and, you know post-generational trauma is a real thing too you know and I think that the language can be posed, you know, can uh, transcend generations as well. And for me to write in any other language doesn't really make sense. My tongue is only twisting around English um, for such a brief amount of time. And I learned Punjabi and Urdu before I learned English. Oh, okay. um, and I so do you go between the different languages in your poems? Like would a poem yeah. have all of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is it like a conscious thing that you're moving between the languages or does it, is it just that sometimes you find the right word in English and sometimes in Punjabi or? Yeah, um, it's, it's sometimes it, I just feel the urge to write in Punjabi and write, write in Urdu. It depends on the mind frame that I'm in. Um, when, I, when I meditate, I love meditating before I do a poetry session. And when I meditate, depending on the mood that I'm in on that particular day, it means where my, where my head goes. And if I happen to be thinking about my grandfather before I do my poetry sessions, that's going to take me in a Urdu frame of mind. Or if I'm mm -hmm. thinking about my 
paternal grandfather I'll think in my Punjabi brain and um, that's that's what it comes down to for me if I'm telling the story of myself um, Urdu and Punjabi have a huge part to play in that that's really cool and I'm a little bit envious that you have those other languages because sometimes it's about how a word sounds or feels isn't it as well as what it actually means um, when you're crafting so you've basically it's like you know if we were drawing you've got a bigger box of paints than I do but but if I can, may I make a suggestion? Yeah. Talk gibberish. It's something <laughs> I encourage. Yeah, talk gibberish. When was the last time you talked gibberish? Because I mean, that means you and I. I'm honest, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that it leveled the playing field just because I happen to be trilingual and I just got very fortunate to have that. Um, doesn't mean that you can't express yourself in ways that I can't. Okay. Uh, you know, gibberish. Make, gibberish make is a lovely word. thing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Do it alone, driving a car, you know, speaking to yourself. It's there's some value in that. Yeah. Yes. No, I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. Okay. I I'm I'm we've we've gone everywhere in this conversation. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed like learning from you. And uh yeah, I have about eight thousand more questions, but you have a life coaching session to get to. So um what thought would you like to leave people with? Um I Firstly, thank you. Thank you for allowing this space and thank you for allowing my my lovely brain and your lovely brain to to have a little dance today. Uh, it's, my pleasure. Been, it's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, I felt very comfortable. Um, last thoughts that I'd like to leave people with is you're all creatives, every single one of you, like regardless of whether you are a doctor, accountant, whatever, um, we're all creatives and take the pressure off yourself. It's, it's like we said earlier in the conversation, it's none of your business what other people think about your creative endeavors and your pursuits. It's absolutely none of your business. Just make it happen because you will feel better for it. And if there's only one thing you took out of today, take your brain, take my brain dump. Mm -hmm. Go do a brain dump. Um, maybe right after this, as soon as we say goodbye, go do a brain dump. It's one of the best things you can do.